Hello again, everyone. Welcome to Washington Gun Law TV. I am Washington Gun Law President William Kirk. Thanks for joining us. You know, this is a very political hot time, and it appears that a lot of politicians are not out there actually looking for their out for their constituents. No, 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 no. They're out there trying to score political points, and they will knowingly pass pieces of legislation sometime, which I think in many ways they know to be unconstitutional. We've talked about it on this video right here. But it's really just decide to ruffle some feathers and score some political points with whatever perceived base they think they might have. Now, one of the absolute kings of that, of course, is California Governor Gavin Newsom. And Governor Newsom recently got a smackdown from Judge Benitez down there in San Diego. And I think it's a very important lesson that we can all learn. So today, we're going to spend a few minutes and talk about how California's recent loss summarizes gun control in a nutshell. Okay, so the issue we are talking about today is a case called Miller v. Bonta and California Code of Civil Procedure 1021.11 better known as California's likely unconstitutional fee shifting. And we're going to explain to that in a moment. Now, as I mentioned in the intro, we have some of these politicians around the country who literally are out there running amok and just trying to score as many political talking points as they possibly can. The king of that on the left is probably Governor Gavin Newsom of California. And why does he drive me nuts? Well, he drives me nuts because as a Washington state resident, I live in a state where all my governor does is just stare at Governor Newsom with goo-goo eyes all the time and try to emulate everything he does. My governor here in Washington state has not had an original idea in the entire time he's been in office. All of his ideas come from copying Gavin Newsom. But when you hear the history of what happened here, you're going to understand how what Governor Newsom and the California State Legislature did basically summarizes gun control in a nutshell. Because we oftentimes talk on this channel about gun control is never about the guns, it's only about the control. And like we spoke about in this video here, we know that 88.8% .8 of all gun crimes are committed by people who are unlawfully possessing a firearm at the time the crime is committed, so therefore we write 88.8% .8 of all of our gun laws to affect that specific community, right? No, of course we don't. No, we write literally 100% of our gun laws to affect folks like you, the lawful and responsible gun owner. And the state that is probably the most guilty of that, of course, is the state of California. Now, the way that California Code of Civil Procedure 1021.11 worked is, is that if anybody challenged any California gun law, okay, that is a private citizen, a legal organization, a large organization, a small organization, doesn't matter. If anyone dared challenge a California gun regulation and ultimately was unsuccessful on any of the challenged grounds, the plaintiff, any organization that they were representing, and the plaintiff's attorneys would be on the hook to pay the state of California all the expenses of having to defend that suit. Yeah, you heard me right. And here's what's even more ludicrous is that the plaintiff could actually be successful. So if we had an imaginary plaintiff here, say Miss Jones, and Miss Jones challenges a California law on four separate constitutional grounds, and ultimately, the highest court in whichever decided it said, you know what, three of these claims are totally ridiculous. But this fourth claim, no, Miss Jones is actually dead right. And the law is then overturned on one constitutional ground. That is, the law is struck down. Miss Jones has prevailed. But you see, since she failed on the other three claims, Miss Jones, her attorneys, and any other organizations, the California Second Amendment Foundation or Firearms Owners of California or whatever other organization that may have been in on this suit as plaintiffs. No, now you are all on the hook 
for the state of California's attorney's fees. Now, here's the sad reality, which a lot of people don't understand. But when you're talking about lawyers over at the Second Amendment Foundation, when you're talking about lawyers over at the Firearms Policy Coalition, when you're talking about lawyers with the Silent Majority Foundation, you're not talking about lawyers who are printing money doing these types of civil rights litigation on behalf of plaintiffs that are having their Second Amendment rights stripped from them. No, as a matter of fact, most of these attorneys are doing these cases pro bono or probably at best just getting their expenses covered. If you all of a sudden put a price tag for plaintiff's counsel, like, hey, by the way, you go ahead and take this suit, but if you don't win, you're going to be writing a $250,000 check to the state of California. You can understand the chilling effect that this would have on litigation, which is exactly the intent that the state of California wanted. Furthermore, there's a chilling effect from potential plaintiffs because if you are Miss Jones under current and normal constitutional law, she can challenge an unconstitutional law. And even if she does not prevail, she is out her expenses, whatever it took to make that challenge, but that would be the end of it. But now if this law were to allow it to stand, Miss Jones would be on the hook for perhaps hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars of legal fees to the state of California if her claim was unsuccessful. Well, this law was challenged in the United States District Court in San Diego before the Honorable Judge Benitez, a judge that we are all familiar with. And the state of California immediately came running into court saying, hey, 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 you know what? They don't even have standing to challenge this because, yeah, although we passed this law, uh, it's not like we really intend on enforcing it, which, of course, begs the question, then why did you pass it to begin with? And we haven't actually enforced it here against the plaintiffs here, so they actually don't have standing. Now, Judge Benitez, who's never been uh, misguided by BS before, was once again not misguided here by the state of California's disingenuous arguments. And he has, in fact, denied California's motion to dismiss this lawsuit and says, no, this suit will proceed on the merits. The plaintiffs here are arguing that, hey, listen, this has two constitutional violations. Number one, I have a First Amendment right to speak out against my government. I have a First Amendment right to challenge anything that I believe is unconstitutional. That is not a novel concept. That is actually how our government is structured under the Constitution. Number two is, is we have a separate statutory claim under 42 United States Code Section 1983. When you're in law school, you geek out on this and call them Section 1983 claims, which is that if you are deprived a constitutional right under the color of state law, you have a claim of action against that government agency. In this situation, what, pe what Californians are claiming is that they are being deprived of their Second Amendment rights under the color of California law, which is exactly what is occurring here. But the point that I really want to make here is that I mentioned at the beginning how so frequently our gun laws have nothing to do with trying to make our community safer. Our gun control laws have nothing to do with the guns and everything to do with the control. And it's not often that we get honest politicians, such as this New Jersey assemblyman, who at least had the guts to say the truth when he said, uh, The last thing I want to say to people, and some of my own Democrats have committed to me, uh, commented to me, this does nothing to uh, stop the illegal gun trade or the legal criminal, illegal uh, uh, possessions or criminal content. You're right. This doesn't. It was never supposed to address that. This is addressing the legal, law-abiding, responsible citizen. That's what it's designed to do. But when you take a look at the history behind California Rule of Civil Procedure 1021.11, take a look at how it was passed. You see, because this was passed through California Senate Bill 1327. What was that? That was in response to Texas Senate Bill 8. What was Texas Senate Bill 8? Texas Senate Bill 8 was an anti-abortion bill. It was a bounty system that the state of Texas came up with that said people could go out and file suit against individuals who were performing abortions. Now, um, we are not going to touch that issue here at Washington Gun Law. We're not touching that issue with a 10-foot pole. But, what essentially Governor Newsom and all of his cronies in the state of California thought was, is that, you know what, the state of Texas has passed a law that we believe is unconstitutional, 
and affects a woman's right to choose, which they believed at the time was a constitutional right. Now, what was their response? Well, they went out and passed an unconstitutional law to thumb their nose at the state of Texas, believing that if they attacked the 2A community, they were somehow or another going to get back at Governor Abbott and all of those horrible individuals who had created this law in Texas. So here's a piece of legislation in California that basically says, hey, you know what? If you dare challenge any of our gun laws based upon your constitutional rights, and you're unsuccessful for any reason, get out your checkbook, otherwise we're going to bankrupt you. And the reason we did this is, well, because we didn't like an abortion law that was passed in Texas. Listen, we will keep track of this case. Once again, it's called Miller v. Bonta. It's kicking around in the Southern District of California, San Diego Division of the United States District Court. In the meantime, if you've got any questions about this case or anything else related to your Second Amendment rights, remember, you can always contact us at WashingtonGunLaw.com or, of course, you can call us directly at 425-765-0487. Now, let's remember, part of being the lawful and responsible gun owner, like we preach all the time here at Washington Gun Law, is to know what the law is in every situation and how it applies to you in any instance that you may find yourself. Until next time, thanks for watching. Stay safe.